morning, Don. Good morning, Zach. How are you doing today? Well, it's okay. I've been out this morning, bought this uh, headset. It's very windy here in Bolton. It's bright, sunny now, and it was raining earlier. And that's about it up to now. You're a Bolton lad. You're born and bred in Bolton. You're oh, still yeah. living there? Yeah, born and bred in Bolton, yes. Uh, still living here. I'm a proud Boltonian. And we're in, we're in Greater Manchester, apparently. But 90% of Bolton people still belong in Lancashire. And that's where we prefer to be, in the Red Rose County, Lancashire. But officially, we're in Greater Manchester. Although I love Manchester City. Manchester City Centre is a brilliant place to be and go. A lot of people in that area, wherever they come from, they all just say they're from Manchester, don't they? Yeah, yeah. If there's any, anybody abroad, say, I was talking to someone abroad, I would say Bolton near Manchester or Manchester, Greater Manchester. You know, because not everybody knows where Bolton is, although it is the centre of the universe. Yeah, there's that sort of credibility. <laughs> there's that credibility of living near Manchester, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I say that Manchester and Liverpool are just satellites of Bolton. <laughs> so you, like I said, born and bred. One thing I want to ask is your your surname, T-O-N-G-E. Do you pronounce it Tong or Tung? It's Tong, T-O-N-G-E, Tong. As in... As in your mouth, tongue. You know. See, you've got a funny way of pronouncing tongue up there. See, I say tongue. I call you Don Tongue. Y- yeah. But if really, you're called Don Tongue. Yeah, uh, but that's how it's spelled. It's spelled with an O and not with a U. I mean, it's like people down south will say, oh, I, I'm buying a house. They mean a house. H-O-U-S-E. With this here, H-I-S-E, highest. You know, it's a bit, you know, our accents, our dialects. I mean, in Lee near Bolton is only about, uh, well, it's not 10 miles away, but they have a different accent than Bolton. It's all thee, thy, and thou. Where they are going, you know, that type of thing. And in Bolton, we might say, oh, I'm going down yon. You know, and they wouldn't say that there. Down yon mean down yonder, you know. Scone debate, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I say I say scone. And you, you'll say scoon, won't you? Uh, no, I'm maybe scone. I, I mean, I've started saying bus, and really it's buzz, B-U-Z. <laughs> you know, we say buzz, I'm going for buzz, you know, but it's bus. And I've, start, I've started saying book, and it's book. You know, I'm, you, I'm, I'm on the change, I think. You know, I, I just think you lot in Manchester are trying to sound posh. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been documenting Bolton? Since the 60s, you've combined... Would you just say you're a street photographer by by heart? I think I would, really, yeah. Very late 60s, I started. And it took me two years to take a decent photograph, I think. But, uh, yeah, late 60s, and um, I got really interested. I got the, the photography bug. And I was out all the time, all the time, taking photographs. Um, and uh, I don't know what it was that started it off. I think... Probably when I was working in the building trade as an installation engineer, that's a pipe ladder, uh, we had a job at um, Ilford Films in Mobley. I think we manufactured the paper and the, and the film. And they had a, a staff shop. And I had a look in one lunchtime, one dinner time, I mean lunchtime. Um, and uh, I bought, <laughs> it was on offer, a, a kit, an, in, an Ilford Instamatic in a box with three flash cubes yeah. and it was cheap. So I bought it and I did a few shots with it like and got the film processed. And then from that, I, 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 for some I got hold of a Polaroid, uh, a Polaroid camera and I started taking pictures of the family, my sister, my mum and the dog and our lodger. And, um, and you'd take them and then it would come out, but you had to like seal it with a squeegee, run the chemical over it. That was like to fix it. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have just disintegrated the uh, emulsion. So you had to like seal it with this. And then uh, I used that, but I didn't like keep buying the film. So then I went and I bought a Helena Paulette electric camera, which is uh, yeah. like an Instamatic. I think I paid about 15 quid for it at a mother's camera shop in Bolton, which are still the mothers of Bolton. Um, and um, and I got that and I used that and then I, th- I took my first good picture with that what I thought was a decent picture 
uh, and I looked at it and I said, I don't like that. And uh, then I went up to a Zenith B, a, a clunk click, a big, solid, heavy Russian camera. A Zenith. I had one. Yeah, I think everybody had one. But this was a Zenith B, not the top of the range Zenith. Uh, interchangeable lenses, but I only had the one lens. The screw mount, wasn't it? Yeah, screw mount, yeah. And uh, I started taking pictures of that, and then I moved through up to uh, Practica, Olympus, and then uh, I started, I got an old norm and larger, 20 quid, it was second hand off someone. He had a ray lens and a few dishes of trays. So I set up some kind of dark room in my bedroom, with plenty of dust in there, and uh, I bought some film and I, and I processed the film, written all the instructions down, and to my amazement, every every negative was beautiful. <laughs> and then I just got I started printing them in my bedroom, and oh, it was amazing. It was that magic, you know, seeing the uh, the image come to fruition, yeah. come to life in the tray. And um, uh, how I, old were you then? How old were you then? I would say I was about nineteen, twenty, about twenty. So you went from Old Spice to stop bath. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, um, and and you were combining this with work. You were combining yeah, this yeah, with, oh yeah. You, was, you started making a living and start trying to sort of find your way as a business and well, photography that as was well. A, that was quite a bit later, actually. That was about another ten. 15 years from this point. Well, I'm going to find out all about that in a minute. I, in front of me, I've got um, three books. I've got Seaside, I've yeah. got The Round House, and yeah. I've got Good Day at the Races. You have Shot in the North, which you self-published through Blurb, didn't you? Yeah, very expensive. I only had 20 copies made myself. I finally just got rid of the last one a few months ago. You can still buy the book on the, like I say, I said book then, I mean book. You can still buy the book on the, on Blurb, but it's not cheap. It's about... Well, when, when Blurb came about, it was becoming, a, it was the sort of transition, wasn't it, for people self-publishing their books, but the, the the bottom line was it was really quite expensive. I've seen some really interesting books on Blurb, which are really, like yours in particular as well, and I first spotted you on Blurb, yeah. where, but the books are like 60 quid, and it sort of doesn't figure in certain... Things for, for you selling them, does it? Yeah, I think it comes it comes up to about thirty eight quid on blurb. Uh, yeah, but what I spent on doing them, I think it looked about five or six hundred quid. You know, Absolutely, what I mean? yeah. and had a dummy done, etc. You know, but I was, yeah. I was quite pleased. The quality is very good at blurb. Yes, it is. They it's are excellent. Good. And you've got. So I was just going to round that off. Really, you've got and you've got three books, little book zines published with. Cafe Royal Books. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a big surprise. I thought, I applied, I thought they might do one, you know, but uh, he, he, Craig, Craig, he runs, runs it, he did, he did three books with, I was over the moon with. I, I had, he had a lot to choose from, uh, and I'm, I'm 95% happy with his selection, you know. He, he's a great promoter, you know, he, prom he promotes like photographers. I mean, I would never have been published. But you know, Cafe Royal Books, they have such a far reaching effect. Uh, I think they've got selections in the uh, moment, you know, Museum of Art in New York and London, uh, the Photographer's Gallery. So I was chuffed because eventually, when I, you know, eventually we're not, not getting any younger. So there's something there, you know, that I, that is my uh, legacy, I suppose. There's something being done. Um, I think he's done a good job. Craig, in, yeah, and I, I, I'm interested with Cafe Royal in a hundred years, and it's really sort of created a massive legacy for British-based photography. Yeah, and it, it, it's going to—I think in the in the next hundred years or so, it'd be a really important sort of period. This, which which Craig sort of instigated. What I want to do is I want to take it back right to the beginning. I want to find out about the person who became the photographer and how photography evolved in your life to where you are now and you can jump through a few of your books and how they came about but just go back to the beginning when you were a young lad right kicking stones off the corner street in bolton go right back and just tell us how it all happened well, well in bolton obviously um uh, lived i got from about seven or eight years old we moved on to a council estate in bolton johnson fold my mother, we lived in a room before that. My mother, my 
father, I can't say dad, father and uh, my sister. And we lived there for a few years, but father being what he was, which I'm being kind of, you know, um, we left, my mother kept leaving my father, well, about a dozen times, say, and uh, eventually the straw that brought the donkeys back. He was a violent man. Uh, we moved out completely and we went living in rooms with me, my sister and my mother, one rooms in uh, a house with quite a few families, Hamden Street, Bolton. And uh, there was a strong smell of urine and I don't need to go on any further about that. So from there, eventually, my mother was able to get a, a, a house, very cheap, a, a terraced house, no bathroom, you know, toilet at the end of the backyard. And uh, I was about 10 or 11 then, and uh, started at primary school. Then I went on to uh, secondary modern school, um, Brown the Fall. And then it was there, there uh, a few years. And then we moved out of... Penn Street, where I live. We, then we moved back up to Johnson Fold and into a place called Gisburn Avenue, which was about 500 yards from where my father still lived. You can imagine, but uh, uh, so I lived there and that, and um, that's where I had my first uh, dark room in my bedroom at Gisburn Avenue. And uh, I'll just uh, go out take pictures. I started work at uh, Hickar Greaves. I left school at 15. No education. We had, um, what do you call it, a careers officer, advice on careers. And I know my letter, I found out later, my application for a job to get, is had 15 spelling mistakes. You know, they should have vetted that. Um, so I weren't happy about that because, but a guy who worked there used to be my swimming coach because I swam for the school, I swam for Bolton, the hometown, for two years, freestyle and backstroke and butterfly, yeah. Uh, did that. And you have to be I lose my thread sometimes. And um, so uh, after um, I started uh, working at Cargreaves, I was there about nine months. I started in the in the stores, you know, with the other guys from the school who started in the uh, apprentice school where they learned the, the turning, the, you know, the engineering stuff. And I was in the stores handing out tools. That's like a dead end place. I was, I was a bit thick at school, no doubt about it. But what's, what annoyed me they, at school, they fast tracked the guys, the boys, who were pretty clever to start with, but they wanted to make sure they got the results. Probably made the teachers and the head look good. But guys like me who were, who were falling behind, they didn't bother about them. I mean, there was one time I sat at the desk at the maths lesson, and I just fold, folded my arms, sat back. And then the teacher could have said, what's wrong, Tom? What's up with you? I said, I just can't do what you put on the blackboard, sir. I said, I don't understand anything about it. And he alluded to me and just carried on walking. I, I thought I was going to get a slap in the back of the head because there was violence in the school. I got uh, quite a few others got knocked about a bit by particularly one member of staff. That's another story. Anyway, so I um, started in Icar Greaves and it was £2.18 shillings a week. And then I moved into the foundry because they wanted a guy in the foundry, a young fella. I was still 15 and uh, I started working in the foundry. It was all the old hand moulding, um, like not Jason's Victorian times. And everybody there saying, get out of here when you can. They said, you know, because it was, was going to close down because mechanised it mechanised. Um, molding was going to be taking over and uh, and I know me so I was looking for a job I didn't know what I'd do I think I got getting ready to be 16 or something and my mother met a, a fella in Yates's wine lodge she, she was um, with somebody I think and uh, he was looking for a lad uh, a mate like to go on jobs in the built in the building trade which was like being a pipe like an installation engineer so I started doing that and the first week I worked seven days. We're on seven days a week. And my first week's wage was uh, 15 and a half quid. Well, from £2.18 shillings to 15 and a half quid, it was, well, I was a millionaire, wasn't I? So I started, uh, I was 16, 17. I got a motorbike and I was riding to Fleetwood on a job because this other guy I started with, he, he started his own, another chap, another young lad, which was his partner's son. So I got like uh, thrown out for no particular reason, except that he wanted a, 
his, his missus, his uh, son to uh, work with him. So myself, I had a motorbike and I applied to another firm and I got a job and I was working on ICI Fleetwood. So I was going to Fleetwood every day on my motorbike. I was 16 then. Uh, you didn't need crash helmets in them days, 1966. So I did that for about a couple of weeks. And then one night, uh, when I'm Johnson Ford, my mum said, oh, we go and get some chocolate. So I get some of my motorbike. I thought, go to off license, you know, right through the estate showing off. Anyway, I hit a car, I don't, broke my leg, and I was in plaster for six weeks, right up to my thigh, which was a bit of a pain, a bit of a nuisance. Anyway, after that, I started um, working again and back at work, and uh, I went to, have I mentioned that I went to uh, Ilford Films? Yeah. Yeah, I thought to march it on. Yeah, so I did that, and, um, and then uh, still taking pictures, sometimes at work and this, that, and the other. And then I knew about Bolton Camera Club, and uh, I, I literally I plucked up the courage to go down because I had a few prints then, about 12, 10, something like that. And I was going to take them down and get some opinions down there. So I went down one night, at one yeah, one night, and uh, there's some. it was a competition night and some of the work was outstanding. It was really, really good. But the FR, there's two FRPSs, ARPSs, masters of photography, these guys were. I looked at my pictures and I looked at the stuff what was hanging on the walls and I, I don't think I even showed anybody. And I went home that night, I think I ripped half of them up. And then I concentrated then on to getting better quality pictures, started reading photographic magazines then, get these practical photography, amateur photography. And there's articles there about print quality, developing films, etc., etc. And then I started entering a few competitions in the photographic press. And to my amazement, I did quite well. Uh, you know, I, I won, won some, come second and third in some. But there was a magazine, it was called Photo News Weekly. And there was a weekly assignment. You had 48 hours to take a picture, develop the film, make the print, get it in the post. And every week, they had a scoring system. You know, you had 1 to 20. You know, sometimes you wouldn't even get on that. And then eventually, I, got, I was climbing up that, and I got pretty near the top. And some did it for two or three years, yeah, some years. But that was a good training ground. Because they say you think of like a water shadow, garden, or building, church. So you had to stick to that theme and come up with a picture, and you had 48 hours to do it, take the picture, dev the film, get it in the polls to them. And it, and it was quite a challenge. Tell your name going up, it was good. And um, I had uh, quite a few pictures. In the camera club, this, this other chap, he was an architectural photographer, medium format, high quality stuff. A man was 35 mil, lift, suit and whitewash. That was like lift, all black, all white, different things like that. And uh, some of my candid street photography. And we had a joint exhibition. It's because like two people from the camera club doing ex opposite things. And uh, that was quite popular. And then I had a lot of pictures and I thought, oh, I'll look around for so get, get a, an exhibition or something like that. I'll show some of my pictures. Granada Television, they um, ran a competition. They ran a competition for, uh, it's called In Focus. Anyway, yeah, it was like a weekly assignment thing again. And I entered it. And I, I did quite well, actually, because I don't just get a mention nearly every week or some weeks I didn't get a mention. Anyway, eventually, they had the result. Uh, and eventually, I was happy to say, I, I won it. And there was, uh, I believe there was about 40,000 entrants. And, and uh, well, I was, I was buzzing one. I had a TV camera on me and all this stuff. And uh, they came into the house, you know, uh, filming and stuff. And that was good. And my, my prize was um, uh, working on an assignment with a professional photographer. That's like a, I was an amateur photographer. So they put me with a professional photographer and we went to Haydock Race Course and they filmed it there and uh, they filmed it just one day's filming. And uh, it was quite good. The adrenaline was flowing in me and the cameras were on me. And But I really applied myself to it. And I was recently, I just scanned a lot of the negatives about only a couple of years ago. And, I, and that came into my book, uh, Good Day at the Races. Nobby Clark, over lunch, he, he liked some of my stuff. And um, and I was, I knew we were a professional photographer, a theatre photographer and press, quite a uh, well-known. And I was talking to him and he said, yeah, I like some of your work. He says it is commercial. And I thought, 
you see, Dickie, I thought I'm just for entering club competitions and mag- magazine competitions. No, and he says, well, he said, well, tell you what, there's this Manchester Theatre group, Manchester Theatre, Manchester Youth Theatre, that was it. Jeff and Hazel Sykes were running it then. And he said, they're looking for somebody to cover their productions and that. So I, I contacted them, went there, nervous as anything, did a few productions with them. And um, you know, they, were, they were okay, the pictures, you know, HP5 at 800 ASA. Totally different setup. Yeah, yeah. Then, like I say, it was all there, but it was stage lighting. You couldn't use flash or anything like that. But, you know, yeah. you, used to do, you shoot through dress rehearsal, you know. And anyway, so that went on. And I, I didn't do any more. But I went into the Octagon Theatre one day. Like I said, I was looking to show some of the pictures and they had the, this this chap the stanley whittaker he was handling all the press etc and uh, he said oh there's a room up here in the bar area so i ended up showing some small eight by six pictures along the wall and everybody seemed to like them the street stuff usually at bolton and then there's the front of house photographer too bad to kill and uh, there was looking so i said let me do it <laughs> so I said I've had experience as a theatre photographer. I had a bloody hell. So I did. I went there and started shooting the uh, dress rehearsals, and I ended up. I was there for about eight years. Uh, three artistic directors doing all the other Shakespeare season. I'm not a clue about Shakespeare. Me, I was just looking at the pictures. But they let me on press days. I could rearrange some of the shots on the press day. <laughs> I used to like it the day the uh, theatre director. Theatre director. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I was, uh, did about three productions for him. Then, for some reason, the point where they both turned around, and I said, no, if you do it like this, turn around, you've got like The director said, I like that. We'll keep that. Anyway, because I was still working in the as in the building trade at that point. I was like yeah. half freelancing, doing the theatre work and trying to do a bit of freelancing, even though we could submitting pictures to magazines, getting them knocked back nine times out of ten. So I'm, I'm doing that, a big front of house, this, that, and the other. And then uh, I was certainly working for a, a, a magazine, the, the Turton scene, which is the local area of Bolton called Turton. And they also had a Blackburn scene as well. So I was working for them. But all the time I was getting the cutouts and pr- little releases and everything that got printed in the local press that I did get, which it, which I'd submitted because I never worked for them. And then eventually I got my NUJ card. Now, in the 1980s, you had to have a sponsor go in front of a panel in Manchester, in my case. And uh, the panel reviews your, reviews your folio or your cuttings, this, that, and the other, to prove that you're in edit- editorial photography, which I weren't really. Uh, and then I knew I got my NUJ card. And then the local press could commission me to go out and do jobs. Well, then I was very busy doing all sorts, just check presentations, you know, school plays and, um, you know, it is uh, just bread and butter stuff. And the people I was making a living, you know, and I eventually moved over, left the building trade altogether and went off as a full-time freelance, you know, famine and feast, sometimes busy, sometimes nothing. And I ended up working for Bolton Council, eventually Lancashire County Council as well. And I was shooting weddings. I've done more weddings than you've had at dinners. And weddings aren't easy. People might, oh, not knock a wedding photographer. But you've got two hours to do come up with the goods. Horrendous weather conditions sometimes and awkward people sometimes. You know, well, it's actually, if you work with actors, you can work with anybody. There used to be good money back then. Well, I, I, yeah, they were for some, for certain, but I wasn't, I wasn't expensive at all. I think I was, oh, I've always been too cheap, you know, but I've, I've put my heart and soul into it, you know, and, uh, but, the, but then, my personal stuff, you know, took a dive, really. I left the camera club scene. To be honest, I spent too much time in the pub because I was still, I was still knocking about with my me, me working mates because that, that other little book I did, my first little zine, Roundhouse, about a working yeah. men's club. I still were going in there, and I still see that guys today. I was, I was drinking with one a couple of weeks ago. No, two or three of them together. And we talk about the old days, this, that, and the other. But they're my old friends, you know, and your old friends are your best friends. But I was still doing that, and I spent too much time in the punk beat. My personal photography really took a back seat. The Roundhouse in the 70s, there's a lot of drinking, pubs, clubs, and yeah. stuff like that. Oh, not so bad. You've got a really quirky style. You understand design, without a doubt. You understand composition. You understand the interaction between environment and humans and, and the theatre. You see it and you can see that in your work. And 
I love the quirkiness in your pictures, the, the sort of theatre, the things coming together in the frame. What was so, What were you looking for when you were looking at people and, and looking at the scenarios going on in front of you? What were you trying to bring together? Well, uh, at the, at the um, good day at the races, I think we were shooting for about six hours and that was it. And the story. So I'm working with a professional. So I think there's a, an adrenaline, <coughs> excuse me, an adrenaline, <coughs> excuse me, an, an adrenaline rush. But uh, I'm just looking at everything and photographing everything. Not not panic shifting or anything like that. But it, I just looked. Ev- I looked everywhere. I went into places like uh, where after a race they'd have a, a, a weigh-in. The jockey had to have a weigh-in. And you're not allowed in there. And I'm not allowed. I didn't know that. I just walked in, started shooting. And then I got thrown out. And it made nobody, it made nobody laugh. He said, you can't go. I said, you did do. You know. And um, Brian Ferry was the, the Roxy Music guy. He was I the, noticed in the book. Yeah, I saw him. Yeah. So I saw him. But uh, <clears throat> I knew I had to take a picture of him. So I went up to him, straight up to him. Because at the background, he was looking. He was like a bit of a snarl looking at me. And then I walked up to him, letting him know I'm not press. I said, look, I'm an amateur photographer and I'm working with a professional today, Brian, Mr. Ferry, I called him. I said, I love Roxy music, uh, Mr. Ferry. I said, do you mind if I take a couple of shots? And he nodded, he says, yes, okay. So I got only shot about three, four shots of him. Then I left him alone then. And that was a bit of a, but so I put it in the book, you know, it's, uh, but then Nobby Clark over lunch, he said, he said, well, Blaine Freddie gets photographed all the time, but, but you, you went up to him and got a picture of him, you know. I said, I just asked him, you know. It was that innocence. Yeah, yeah, that's it. A bit naive, bit innocent, adrenaline flowing. Yeah. What lenses were you using? Then I had a, a compact. I used to use a, an Olympus RD, a compact. A belt. I wish I still had it. A cracking little 35 mil. It's used, I think, aperture, automatic, semi-automatic, aperture priority only. And then it'd be, it'd be auto. So I'd use that as a small pocket camera, which I've taken most of my pictures from, from the 70s, 80s with that camera. And then I had an, an SLR. It might have been an Olympus with a, I'm not sure I had a zoom lens on it. I think it might have been a, a 135. And I might have had them, I can't remember. But it, it, it might have been a 135 and the compact, just the two cameras. Yeah. Just, you know, running film through them and, and that. It's interesting listening to you when you said the turning point for your approach to your photography changed when you started comparing your work to other people at, and the guy at the camera club. And then you sort of took on a more in-depth approach and a more... You you started immersing yourself in the work of other people, and what what interests me purely because initially when I first looked at your work, where it was geographically Bolton, I wondered if Humphrey Spender and the mass observation had some influence on you and what you took from that. What how did did that have any sort of part of your progression as a photographer? Well, I knew about Humphrey Spender. Casually, uh, this is all, don't forget, this is like pre-internet. There was no uh, yeah. big World Wide Web then. Uh, and it, it kept coming up and uh, some people talk about it. But then there'd be the other article in the photographic press. And then my friend who was from Bolton, uh, I took an interest in it. And I had, I had the uh, work time book. Uh, well, you did a great review of it, by the way. Zach on the on the camera uh, on your on your camera on YouTube, it's really good, and uh, I liked a lot of his work and, and the locations he used. Um, it was um, Clarence Street in Bolton, the same area, the same area, and I shot in the same places, um, even where they had the HQ. Uh, I forget the name of the street now. I know the street. And I shot a lot of my stuff in that area where he went, just by coincidence. Uh, now, I, I took a lot of my stuff in the 1970s uh, as an amateur. And apparently he did a lot of stuff there as well. And then he revisited, I believe, in the 1980s. And I didn't know that. But it, it went on. And he did it, it was in 2001. I'm jumping forward quite a bit now. 2001, Humphrey Spender 
did a talk in Manchester at the corner house then. So I went down there, I, t- I took my work uh, town book, listened to him talking, he was about 91 then. And uh, he signed the book eventually, I had a bit of a chat with him. And I bought another book there for a friend of mine, Jeff Davis, who was a Bolton Camera Club member and a very good photographer. They're both on the uh, same line, same page in a lot of ways. Yeah. And he just be- Jeff had just become president of Bolton Camera Club. And I asked him for spend. I told him this. I said, could you dedicate it to Jeff Davis? On his on it on his uh, becoming president of Bolton Camera Club, two thousand and one, and he did he written it on like by hand, and I thanked him for it. And you know, I had a little chat with him, other people were around him, obviously, and uh, he came over as a very calm, settled, happy, contented man, and uh, he talked really, he talked really fluently and friendly and. Uh, you just, you just, everybody were around him, just uh, in in awe of him in a way. But I did take some pictures of him there and then. I didn't really intention to, intended doing that, but I did do. Uh, I went along with another friend, and he, he, I've got him on one of the shots. I only, I lost the negatives, and I only found them about a couple of years ago. The negatives, so I, I printed them. Now, now there's a little bit underexposed, all that lot, blah blah blah, but. Um, I got them in, got run them through my leg scanner and they come cool scan. And uh, with Lightroom and Povoda Shop, you can adjust the levels. You can, you can sometimes you can make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And, uh, you know, and I've, I've found, anyway, I've, I've printed them, is that the other? No, I've got them now. But um, since digital, I've found that a, a, a lot of my negatives, some are slightly under and slightly over, it's just the way it happened. Although I did use a Western meter, especially on wedding, doing instant mm. light reading. But many a time, point and shoot, point and shoot, with an aperture yeah. priority. Uh, and you forget, sometimes you're moving in, on, into shadow, into sunlight, into a building, out of the building. And then you just press the shutter first, then look at the settings after. Yeah. You know, and that many a times. But since going digital, and now I can go back in my archive and looking at some dodgy looking negatives, Put them through this system and edit them, and and you can bring them to life again. And a lot of my work is um, is the seventies, eighties, nineties, and I, I had about twenty years where I was in the pub, something like that. Staying on the work town theme, and and Spender, in, you did the seaside book, and Spender went to Blackpool. Did you, it was, you know, getting the working man's leisure time when they were in Blackpool having the holidays and stuff. No, I didn't. Um, what I did, I, I, I bought the Martin Parr book, Seaside. Cafe Royal Books did re released 500 copies. Uh, no, it was a, a, a book, Seaside. It's a, a new book. Uh, Cafe Royal Books did. It's not, not a reprint, it's a first edition. And they sold out now. And uh, that, I looked at that, and uh, fantastic. Martin Parr's early work is fantastic really good and I must get some more of his early stuff I've got a couple of see I'll go off the thread and uh, and that inspired me it was Martin Parr's book that inspired me to look at my seaside pictures going back through the decades and I found out I, I had more than what I think and uh, there's some I've left out and this, I've found some more similar ones some good ones since going back through my archive. But no, I didn't, I never thought of Humphrey Spender like that. That you never influenced me. I liked his work a lot, you know, but there's so many other people doing good stuff. And have you had any association with Martin Parr? Because I've seen you've got some pictures of him in your archive. Had, had, have you had a... No, I can't say I've met him. Uh, he signed a book for me. See, I said book again, <laughs> book <laughs> in Bolton. Uh, he signed, I've had a couple of books signed by him. Strange and Familiar is an exhibition he curated in that book. I bought, he got him to sign that. And I, I took a picture of him. I asked him, said, Martin, can I, you know, but he says, yeah. So I took a picture. I quite like the photograph, actually, because I, I, I cut half the book off and it just says Strange and Familiar. Well, Martin Parr's early work and his later work, it's debatable. The different opinions on it, like it is on everybody. You know, but I love his early stuff. So he signed that for me. And uh, what else? Uh, but his seaside work influenced me to do a seaside book 
No doubt about that. I won't, without, without me buying that book from Cafe Royal Books, I don't think I'd have done Seaside. But I know a lot of books, folder books, they have a running theme through it, uh, you know, and uh, like a narrative so all the way through it. And I'm, my first book, uh, Shot in the North, it was, and I put in, it's just a selection of my personal favourite photographs I've taken. And there's no, there's no rhythm with it or anything. You know, but good day at the races, there is a Miss Eastside book. It's okay, you know, there's a bit of a theme thrown it. Well, there's nearly water on every one, Mark. I love all your books. I, I do particularly like Good Day at the Races. I think it's a really, some really good stuff in there. You mentioned Paul, we've mentioned Spender. Who has been a real influence in this sort of, as a photographer, in their style with your work? Who, who really sort of got to you? There's so, there's so, yeah, there's so many. Uh, as you know, uh, it's a difficult question to answer. But I'm, I'm recently been looking at some Elliot Irwin. You know, some of his stuff is uh, fabulous. And Elliot Irwin, what a career he's had. Uh, Magnum, I think he was is in the White House photographer. I think he was, you know, shooting the president and all that stuff. And uh, what went on the White House, and he's done such a a wide spectrum of stuff, a, a wide, a wide variety of photographs. See, I'm see, I'm going a bit um, losing the thread a bit. I like Rob, Robert Frank's Americans, you know. But surprisingly, it's Cecil Beaton. I've got a book of Cecil Beaton, war photographer, war photographs. But some of his uh, his portraiture, uh, I know he get these big fancy sets. He set it up, and I think he was a member. Of, was it the Bloomsbury Group in the 1930s? You know them. Than 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 having all toffs like you. But I, I love I love his work. Uh, some of his portraits and, and stuff is uh, is fantastic. And uh, obviously Cartier Bresson, um, like Bill Brandt stuff. Um, there's so many. It's different. I've got a book. Eugene Smith. You know, but what a dedicated man that Eugene Smith was to his work. You know, uh, of course. Spent three years. In Japan, yeah. shooting, um, I think it was some chemical poisoning of people. And uh, people like that, uh, they're really, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not knocking myself, but I've never really committed myself to one particular project long enough. As I look through my archive, I, I look at photograph lots of children playing in the streets in the 70s, 80s, and oh. 90s. But now you, uh, you can't point a camera with a child playing in the street. Well, you don't see any playing in the street anymore. But um, I mean, Shirley Baker, uh, I like, I've got a Shirley Baker book. And uh, I met Shirley Baker, she had an exhibition at the uh, the Lowry, giving a talk there. And uh, I got a couple of photographs of her. She let me photograph. I got a lovely letter back from her, from sending the, the picture to actual prints, I think, then they weren't... Uh, they weren't digital uh, files then. So uh, I'm not sure. No, they weren't digital. They were actual prints I sent to her. And she sent me a lovely letter back. The book you mean was, um, the Eugene Smith book was Mini Matter. Mini Matter, yeah, that's that's it. And, uh, but his, his, his essays, were for, I think it was for Life magazine. Yeah. You know, the, the famous The Country Doctor and there's yeah. many more. And it, of course. But he, he did, I think he did set one or two of them up in a way, which... If you're looking for, you know, a slightly thing, but it, they're still like fantastic pictures. Yeah. I think we got to the, you went down to the pub bit. Yeah. Where go? Where do we go from the pub now? Well, usually, usually, usually a nightclub. <laughs> 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 you know, honest to God, I spent too much time in the boozer and there's nothing, I've had more hangovers than you've had at dinners, let's put it like that. It's nothing to be proud of. It's just the way it was. I'm Don, still, yeah. it must have been about 80p a pint, was it? I I remember when I left school. I mean, I left at 15, but I started drinking when I was 16. I think it was about 1 in 10. <laughs> this was before decimalisation. About 1 in 10, and we're all mourning when we went up to 1 in 11. <laughs> well, like that, yeah. you know. Uh, well, I did spend too much time in the boozers, in the nightclubs, because after you'd done a wedding... Done a, a PR shoot, a, a local check presentation for the local press. You know, all you want to do is sit down, watch, tell they'll go for a drink. 
Last thing you want to do is go walking down the streets taking pictures. It's weird how it is, and a lot of people can mix it both, but I didn't. What year was this? Where were we then? When the that was probably all through the seventies, all through the late seventies, all the. But that's when I was doing my street stuff. I didn't really start freelancing full time till about the mid eighties, because I'd be doing fifty percent, say, freelancing photography and fifty percent in the building trade. We used to get, but it was a bit flexi time in the building trade. I used to get, give, give, I used to get a job, like it's like. 500 quid to do a job. It might be in Glasgow, uh, it might be Blackpool, it might be anywhere. And that's all you got, and that included your expenses, everything. So if you got it done in five days, you got 500 quid. If you, got, if you, do, if you took five weeks, you got 500 quid. Mm. So I would do that, and then I'd, I'd try and mix in some of my freelancing at the same time at the Octagon. They used to make me laugh. Uh, I'd be in the Octagon Theatre doing a dress rehearsal, and I'd be like, Oh, darling, yes, yes, it was marvellous, marvellous interpretation of such a body. And then day after, I'd be under a tank, effing and blinding, covered in fiberglass, piss wet, <laughs> wet through. Um, it was like, I was, I was living in two parallel worlds, two, 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 two lines, I was two people. And uh, I, I like to think I could mix in that society a little bit. And, uh, but I'm still working class bloke. You know, but I, when I was working for the Bolton Council, I did loads of jobs. I, I was mayor, mayor after mayor after mayor came and went, and I was still there. And I got on with all of them, really. And one day, uh, I think the Duke of Westminster, he was opening this shop in Marlin Bolton. And I, was, I photographed it for the local council, etc. And then it goes back to the town hall. And then I got, well, I think it was the mayor or mayor, I said, oh, Don, are you staying for tea? So I put my camera down and I sat at the table, Mayor and Mayor, some other dignitaries from the building, and I was sat next to the Duke of Westminster. And uh, so the tea's going around, the tea, dead civilised, you know, tea, teapot, milk. Sugar. And uh, the Duke of Westminster says, uh, turned around to me and says, do you take sugar? I said, yes, your grace, thank you. <laughs> and he passed me the sugar bowl. So that's my fame to claim. I've, I've photographed... Uh, one time in the 80s, Chris Bonington was um, up in Bolton at Rivington. I think Northwest Water might have been taking over this uh, this, reserv- this set of reservoirs in a beautiful place, Rivington, near Bolton, Rivington Pike, not far from Winter Hill. And uh, I thought, well, I'm going to try and, because I, I was trying to freelance and, you know, and submitting stuff in. So I thought, I'll, I'll take a picture of Chris Bonington. Anyway, Benny Rothman, he was of the Mass Trespass fame in the 1950s, Kinder Scout. He was going to be there with um, Chris Bonington, one of the dignitaries and one of the celebrities type of thing. So somehow some I got hold of Benny Rothman's phone number uh, and I rang him and I got through to Benny Rothman. I said, oh, Benny, so I said, I believe you at the uh, Rivington thing tomorrow with Chris Bonington, etc. He says, oh, yes, yes, yes. I said, what time are you going to be arriving? And he says, uh, what time is Chris going? He said, well, I'll be arriving. So he said, but Chris is going there earlier. He says, oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, he's doing a bit of climbing. But the, in, in Angle's arc. So he said, yeah, because there's some quarries at Angle's arc. He says, oh, yeah, right, thank you. So what I did the day after, I went to Angle's arc early and uh, goes up, climbs my way up, went my way around there a little bit. And then suddenly there's a, a good edge of, and Chris Bonington's coming up. He's coming up the crag up the side of the quarry. And I stuck my head over and I says, hi, Chris. I said, do you mind if I take a couple of shots? He said, oh, no, carry on. You know, and he's climbing up and I've got some pictures of him walking up. And he says, oh, you're too old for this, Bonington. And he just, he's just done Everest. He just, he was sending like letters from Everest to the Observer, which I used to, read his letters, et cetera, his adventure to Debris. And he gets to the top and he had a, ended up with a rope round him and this, that, and the other, and I got some more pictures of him. And I was really pleased with his pictures. So uh, I didn't I didn't go to the event. I, I rushed back home, developed the films, made some prints, and I rang, I rang the newspaper, The Guardian, I think it was. Uh, I didn't bring anybody else up. And they said, yeah, they're interested. So I took the prints, I'd made over to Manchester 
to get them on uh, a circular, we used to send them by wire in them days. That's right. Yeah, and they wired it down. Anyway, the Guardian, the day after they, they used it, they used the picture. I was really made up. They'd used the picture, no name credit, photo done, Tom. And, uh, well, you can imagine it. You get a real buzz out of things like that. Uh, but it was a lot of work, you know, and I don't think they got paid a right lot, but it, it was, you know, it's, it's like getting your name around. And I ended up, you know, I did a few jobs for, uh, one or two jobs for the Times, got a got couple of pictures in the Times newspaper, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't pursue that too much because I was busy doing weddings, local press, and going in the pub. Um, you know, and then just time just went on, you know, to... And that's how, that's how it is. And just carried on working as a freelance. Uh... The the buzz of being printed never stops, does it? Oh, yeah, it doesn't. Uh, I've still got my spreads. I've had some in the photographic press, you know, from the 1970s, 80s yeah. competitions. And, uh, and some of them like toothpaste spreads, which is a good. You still get a buzz out to see your stuff in print. And, and what I've started doing now is I'm going to trawling through my, my archive, black and white negatives, is I'm started having prints made because there's nothing better than a hard copy print in your hand. You know what I mean? To, to look oh, at. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. Or, or, or on a gallery wall or something like that. Um, and I'm, I'm starting now having 16 by 12 prints made. Uh, and I keep getting printed and they're building up now. So there'll be something there because everything's on hard drives and, and 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 dongles and DVDs etc. And they might just get lost and never get played or whatever. But a, a physical print could be there for a long time. Ian Barry said to me about twenty years ago. He said you can't delete an egg. Yeah, no, like, yeah, no, yeah, you, you're you're right. There. You can't delete an egg. But that's why we have backup, don't we? I mean, I'm back. I've got cloud backup, and I've got on an external air drive backup. Because I have had a computer crash and I lost some stuff. The worst thing is I've lost some negatives I can't find, you know what I mean? And that's another story. Do you find the last 10 years is a sort of coming together with all your work and a way there you could get now your work out there and you feel that your legacy is being shown and people are taking notice of all the work you did back there. How important has this all been for you? And, it being excuse me, very important, uh, you know, since the World Wide Web and the internet and social media has been a big thing for me, actually. And I've only embraced social media in the last three years. And I'm still having trouble with it now. Uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter and Facebook. And uh, I like to submit it, but some of the comments I've had off some of my work, it's been really good and encouraging. And I've actually sold a few prints from it as well, actually, and promoted my book. It means now I'm not invisible. And to a lot of other photographers, they would be otherwise invisible, you know, because if nobody knows about you, you know. Yeah. So I believe in, in self-promotion, because if you don't do it yourself, nobody else will. Absolutely. And the Facebook thing, it's when I first started uploading a couple of years ago on Facebook, some of my stuff from the 70s, Especially, some of the, the the comments are hilarious, and I've got I've, I've cut and pasted a lot of the comments, and I, I want to use them for a project I'm thinking about. The, absolutely, the people the people have put names to faces on my prints, you know, wow. and it's made some people very happy. I'm, they've never seen the picture of the the late fathers or sometimes the late children. It gives you a bit of a buzz, like, uh, to, it's spreading a little joy. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is, the people of Bolton have been my uh, source for photographs for, for decades. And to post them on Bolton Facebook groups, there's about four or five Facebook groups just about Bolton. You know, I belong to Bolton, Bol Bolton in the 70s, blah, blah. There's quite a few Bolton Facebooks, and I paste to them all. And uh, I just love reading some of the comments. I post on Twitter and I post on uh, Instagram. The, all the comments that I went to, into um, Bolton Art Gallery, Bolton Museum and Art Gallery, nearly a couple of years ago, and I took some pictures in, and I, I took some of these comments in, put them on a on the A4 and printed them out. And they, and they loved them. They loved the comments. Anyway, you know, I got a, 
I got a, an exhibition in a small room in the Bolton Art Gallery, which was a real buzz. I didn't think I was going to they'd, they'd be interested in exhibiting, you know, because uh, I nobody knows me. I'm, I'm not a name like uh, Homer Sykes or, uh, you know, what's the other guys called? Miller Favorite Photographers. There's, you know, but, uh, but because it was local mm. and, and Bolton Facebook, local people, and what they did, they got a, a lovely, lovely room. They laid it all out pretty good, actually. And they put printed some of the comments on the wall. You know, this was in 2021. And it was only on for, because of COVID, it was only on for, it got delayed and delayed. It ended up six week run. And for, I think for about two of those six weeks, the gallery was closed altogether. And when it was open, it was maths only, two people in it at a time. And it was, you know, it was a bit disappointing, but it was still good to have it there, you know. Eventually, I'd like to have a, another exhibition, a bigger one, you know, with more stuff in, just to, you know, just to promote Bolton and probably promote myself a little bit because I like the thoughts. I mean, I've had, I sell on Etsy.com prints, which uh, and they're, they're pretty cheap, actually. They're too cheap again, me. And then the uh, British Cultural Archive, They've got some of my photographs in, in the BCA, British Cultural Archive shop, and they've sold a few of my prints. Yeah. And they take, well, they're after 2022 is, is the year they're going to have a permanent space in Manchester. That's really exciting, though. It yeah, is, it is really great. exciting. I mean, uh, North East have got, is it Grey? North East, what's the gallery? Amber, Amber. North East have got a gallery. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? With Tom Studdard, I did, the late Tom Studdard had an exhibition recently. Yes. You know, so he's always passed away recently. Oh, brilliant. I've got, yeah. one of the, I've got one of Tom Studdard's Sarajevo book. Uh, anyway, like Liverpool have got Open Eye and Bradford have got the impressions. So yeah. Manchester should have something really good. And what they do, they sell a, they sell a print and they, they keep 50% towards the you know, for funding towards this new space. Yeah. And, and then you get 50% paid into your account, you know what I mean? So I'm only saying I'm a pensioner now, you see, and every penny helps, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think your work is really important. I'm very surprised you haven't been asked to submit a whole series of prints for some archive to the Manchester Library or whatever it is or something like that. And, and I'm sure something like that will come. How do you think people are going to look at this work in 100 years? What important part of the British culture do you feel you portrayed? Well, I have done. I think, like I say, the people are bought. It's mainly working class. You know, the working class, you know, kids in the street playing. Uh, it's a, it's a, it was a time when you could, a time of innocence, really. And they say, oh, we could leave our front door open. But it's actually true, you could. When I lived in Penn Street, you could do that. People were always walking into one another's houses. And in summertime, they'd all sit on the streets, on a chair with a cup of tea, chatting to one another. A big lot, you know. That's how it was. There's more community spirit in that time. Kids, kids like Shirley Baker's picture, sixties, seventies. Kids skipping in the streets. Old ladies. You said you, you, you didn't need CCTV then when you had a, old women stuck gossiping at the door doorsteps because they knew everything. Who were doing what, where, and when. Uh, but I think because even now, the platform shoes, the flared trousers and the tank tops, rings are 70s. So even now, everybody's into nostalgia, no matter how young you are. Even 20-year-olds now thinking what they were doing when they were 17 in Ibiza or whatever. So we're, every, it's nostalgia is is everywhere. And everybody's into nostalgia. And everybody, anybody who says they're not, I don't believe them. Uh, but I think but what's good... Today, I mean, what, what have we got today? I mean, in 100 years from now, I mean, today, this moment in time, there's uh, the, the face mask. There's obviously the net and the, the, the mobile phone, the smartphone. God, the, the world is passing people by. They've, they've got a smartphone in front of the faces continually. I mean, and I, I embrace, I embrace technology, but I only use social media on my laptop, I will not use it on my smartphone at all. Uh, just on my laptop and my desktop computers, I'll do social media. Otherwise, that's it. Because uh, 
Well, it's, it's like you could get you could get like a family driving through the Lake District in say autumn when all the leaves are turning gold red. You know, the, the, the mum and dad's in the front, two, brother and sister in the back. They both got their head in a smart and the smartphone talking to their friends where they are, but they're not seeing where they are. They're telling where they are without appreciating the beauty of the Lake District, say. You know, and I think life's passing a lot of young people by. John, what are what you looking back, you know, from the moment you innocently picked up the camera and started documenting the world around you? What was behind that? I think we all want to express ourselves in some way. And I couldn't write... I was no good at school, but, and I was taking pictures for a, a couple of years before I got one picture of these children in a parade. And I, I, I went around, I, I, went, I put myself down to their level. I was, and I went like I'm one knee, say, and I took a picture of them and these were saluting in different positions. I thought, God, I like that picture. And then that was very early seventies. And then that's, that's when I was it just started, that's when I joined the camera club. And looking about, learned about from FRPS's masters of photography about composition, grain tone, you know, the tonation of grays, you know. And that's when I really knew that that's what I wanted to do be a photographer, take photography as an amateur, be an amateur photographer. And it was everything to me because I'd be out even when I got married. I got married in 1971. I was out with my camera all the time. You know, everywhere, you know, pointing, shooting. I was taking photographs of everything. You know, I got the, the photography bug. That was it. No intention of making a living from it, but it was a photography bug. You know, and, and, and anybody in them days, but you're a novelty. If you walk around the streets with a camera around your neck, kids used to shout out, hey, mister, take me picture. And obviously you did do. Uh, and there was nothing, nothing seen in it. You're nothing, nothing bad about that. Not like today, you couldn't do it. Uh, so you're a bit of a novelty, and they just saw things and just took them. But some of the things I've been printing recently, uh, pictures, that, that when I took at the time, I don't know why I took it, but now, because time, a few decades have gone by, they're, more, they're a lot more interesting now than they were then. And I found other odd things. And I found like running, they have a 36 exposure in a film. And I'd probably get through to about 33, 34 shooting something. So you know the film's going to run out. So you would, I was like, I've got to use these two frames. Up. I'll take that there. Look at that. Then you'd wind the film back and put another one in. And some of them last frames on many roll of film are very interesting for some reason. And I didn't plan anything because I'm, I'm basically a point and shoot camera guy. I'm not technically minded. I'm completely self-taught. Even now today, I've got I've just got a cracking new camera, and the, what it will do, it does everything except make the T, the the, the, the X one hundred V Fuji. It's a brilliant camera, and I and I still use it as a point and shoot camera. I'm not into four K video or anything like that. I'm not interested, and it's got, and I'm going to set it onto monochrome because everything I convert from black and white, uh, shooting colour now. I usually convert it to monochrome, black and white. So some of these settings they've got now, these recipes for, uh, there's about three or four black and white settings. You know, you can put in a red, yellow filter if you want, you know. Yeah. I, I do really find the, the transition with photographers in the 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s. I'm interested in that bit where they just did it and and because now like you said it's we're in a point yeah. shoot culture everybody's got a camera but then you it's all sort of seen a camera was a big thing and it wasn't and it, nothing was accessible you had to really search and find and look up yeah, and read yeah, books yeah. and so i was always intrigued to what made you just pick a camera up what was the minute you what was that point where you were inspired to to pick something up which you probably knew nothing about. Yeah, it, it was that that time when I picked that Instamatic up, and uh, so I don't know why I did it. Maybe it were on offer. Maybe it were half price. I don't know. Uh, I picked it, up and then I just took pictures with it, knowing then that I wanted another camera. Just taking pictures of family, dog, and whatever. And and I don't know. And then I got the, the it was a, gr a, a gradual progression, you know, to becoming a full time freelance. But it started very slowly and went through very slowly till, till I became a full-time freelance. But I enjoyed, I must admit, when I won a competition, 
in the camera club. Uh, and then you're, you're exhibited at Lank LNCPU, which is Lancashire and Cheshire Photographic Society's annual exhibition. You know, uh, you get a real buzz seeing your picture on a wall. You know, in the camera club, I had an exhibition every year. And you see that, and that was it's really good, you know. That's awesome. What's your plans for the future then? What's next for you? I've got an idea. All these comments... There's quite a lot of comments from the people of Bolton, particularly about my 1970s pictures. But I don't want to dwell in the 1970s. I'm, on a, I'm still, I still get out shooting occasionally, and I'm, I want to bring it right up, Bolton, right up to 2022, when we're not there yet. Uh, I've got an idea for a for a book, spanning the decades, 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 in my hometown, Bolton. But it only have appealed to Bolton people, you know. Uh, so no, I can't see a publisher being interested in, in that. Because I think David Lewis, he always says that. He, he gets thousands of submissions for books every year. And one of the first things he says, it's got to have like worldwide interest. You know what I mean? It's got to have, you know, a narrative, a theme, something like that, a story running through it. But it's got to be, like, universally interesting instead of just, you know, my, my little village and my little town, you know. Uh, but I'm, I think I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do it um, on my hometown. But I want to incorporate some of these comments with some of the photographs. But then again, I'll do it. I might have to just self-publish it and... Uh, but well, myself publishing, I mean, I've done it, not myself publishing, but I totally by myself. But right, I've got to help me with my writing, you know, because my writing's pretty abysmal, really. I've got all the right words, but I just can't get them in the right order. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I need help with that, you know. Don, I think what your work's screaming out for is one book which charts your record. And I think there's plenty of people out there who could help you get that and there's no reason why you couldn't put a book like that out i think it'll happen and you know i think ways and means and we'll talk more about this off away from here and and, and i'll see if i can help you and um we'll we'll, we'll work on some strategies together and i'll see, see hopefully see because I, I do think and I, I always i was scratching my head a few times why there isn't the sort of complete works of you in one book. And I think it should happen. I think it will happen. And it, you say, well, you know, it needs mass world recognition. Appeal, like appeal, yeah. It doesn't. It oh. doesn't. It doesn't. This This is this is about documentary. This mm. is about British culture. This is a lot of books like this at the minute in terms of life's works and stuff like that. And this should have that status. So we'll talk more about that. I will do a review all for the next, this year of these books as well. But we'll oh, talk more on that. that. Don, man, it's it's been a pleasure and I've really enjoyed listening to you and I've listened to your stories and just hearing about what makes you tick and, you know, the ups and downs of life and, and stuff. And it's been a real pleasure. And Thanks for all this, Zach. I mean, I was very apprehensive about doing this because, like you, like you can tell, I mean, I'm not well read and uh, I'm not... I, I'm one thing that bugs me. I mean, I didn't have a, a good education. I'm not blaming them or anything. It's, it's got its benefits. But uh, I always, one of my big regrets is uh, not having a better education. But uh, I know you can self educate yourself later on in life, but if you're spending half your time down the pub, you can't do that. You know what I mean? At school, I mean, I was near the bottom of the class in, in everything, except one year I come, uh, I come top in history and top in religious instruction, RI, religious instruction. And I'm an atheist, you know. So, so then that, was, that was, you know, that surprised me, you know. But uh, but like I say, I think uh, all these things are meant to, to mean something. If Maybe if I'd been a well-educated guy, I'd have been in another job, in an office, and direction and my life would have taken a different. No regrets. No regrets. Don, well, I'll oh, thank you because had you gone another way, we might not have seen these pictures. So your education has come out in another way and has come out in the way you visualise the world. Don't, don't knock yourself, mate. You've, you've done yourself proud, you know. This will this will be your legacy. We're really pleased that you did it, you know. This is your contribution. And I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of other people really pleased what you've done. No, I'm not knocking myself. No, I'm not. Don, let your pictures, let your pictures talk.
Well, you, if you can edit this right down and make some sense, you're, you're a good man, Zach, you know what I mean? Because I do meander on a bit and I do my thing, I do get mixed up. But I'm not a good speaker, I know that. I've been asked to do a talk. I've just not got the confidence, like, uh, for some reason. But uh, thanks, thank you, Zach. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure for me too. All, all the best, mate. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, okay, we Zach. Be good. Forward, see you then. Bye bye. Bound down, see us. Careless corpse, see us. Steel dawn. We are stone. We are stone. See us born, see us wind down, see us fly low to our blind.